talk about my uh, favorite mission that's close to the sun. Um, so I'm going to tell you what's up with the sun and some recent results from NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Um, so a little bit about myself. I uh, have worked in lab, as, as uh, Cece was saying, for about 20 years now. This is me inspecting one of the mirrors uh, in the sounding rocket. So this is a sounding rocket that we launched out of the desert uh, in uh, 2012 in, uh, in New Mexico. And then uh, worked with a variety of other NASA satellites. Um, we have uh, Hinode uh, Solar Satellite, which is a collaboration with JAXA. Um, worked a little bit on Hubble data, Chandra data, um, as well as this atmospheric imaging assembly, which is uh, pictures of the sun every 10 seconds. Um, and uh, these groups, this is some of the people that I work with. So science, again, is never done alone. Um, these are just a few of, of my many colleagues that I've had the honor to work with over these years. So other things about me is I love the beach. Um, so I, uh, I definitely crave my beach time and getting looking forward to summer. Um, I'm a yoga instructor and a yoga, uh, yoga teacher on the side. Um, and I love cupcakes. And uh, I also have a cat who you might see wander, wander through every once in a while. So that's a little bit about me. So returning to those beaches that I love so much. Um, so this is one of those things that the sun gives to us is that the sun is important because it sets the temperature um, at the earth along with the atmosphere um, that we're able to have liquid water. And we're also able to have this warmth and it's something that we've adapted to and are able to thrive on this planet. Um, unlike others that are too hot, such as Mercury or Venus or too cold uh, like Mars or, or Neptune or, or further out. Another uh, thing that the sun does is to create this beautiful aurora. So as it, um, as the sun creates space weather that travels to the earth and interacts with our atmosphere, um, and that activity shows up as, as northern lights. And the northern lights, um, or southern lights, depending on where you are, um, tend to focus on the poles. Um, so you, you have to be kind of north to see these things. And they're beautiful dancing sheets. If you, if you ever get the chance to take a trip to see them, I highly recommend it. I was lucky enough to see them in Michigan um, during the last solar maximum or, or two solar maximums ago. And uh, they were just absolutely incredible uh, sights to see, very mesmerizing to watch. So when we look at the sun, um, kind of with our, our plain eye, and again, we never look directly into the sun with our, with our own eyes, because that will damage them. But if we safely look at it uh, through the right filter and the telescope, we see a relatively yellow ball with only this um, black spot here, um, or maybe a couple of spots, depending on the time. Um, on the time, And those are sunspots, and those are the centers of magnetic activity and kind of gave the first clues that the sun was magnetic. Now we didn't have to wait till the space age to, in order to actually understand this. Um, drawings from uh, as early as 11, I think this is 1130 AD uh, or uh, common era is, uh, there, were, there were drawings of the sun with spots on them. Um, and that magnetic, uh, that magnetic characteristic was recognized. These were drawn in 1873 of a sunspot. So you see these beautiful tendrils um, of uh, plasma and gas um, focused in and then darker areas here uh, with more concentrated, concentrated material um, that you were able to draw basically from looking at, again, a, a, safe, uh, a safe telescope. So into the space age, and we were able to actually take pictures of the sun. So what we did is we used an occulter. This is a occulter disk. The sun would be the size of the white circle. We uh, blocked out the sun around it, and we see this constant flow, these explosions that we were talking about, coronal mass ejections, billions of tons of material um, coming at us at millions of miles an hour, equivalent to what would be 80 million school buses. Um, so this is a lot of mass being hurled out in all directions, um, as well as this constant flow of solar wind um, from, the, from the sun. Uh, and so those, those eruptions are, are here, and this is just about a quarter of the sun, and this is the approximate size of the Earth. So we also see how little the Earth is compared to these large structures, these large, huge, huge explosions, these temper tantrums that the sun, uh, that the sun sun throws. So this is something that um, can not only affect the earth, and again, the earth is not this close to the sun, this is just for scale, um, but it's something that we need to, uh, to think about. 
um, as we become a, uh, we further explore the solar system. So Parker Solar Probe um, has actually, was 60 years in the making. Um, and we're doing it because we're explorers. Um, and there's this practical matter of living with a star, as I was talking about, with all those coronal mass ejections and flares, um, huge magnetic uh, explosions, and then also scientific uh, curiosity. So Parker Solar Probe was first proposed by S the Simpson Committee of the Space Science Board um, in 1958. And that was the same, um, the same committee recommendation that was to found NASA. So the, the question goes back to the very beginnings of, of NASA. And looking at those space weather drivers, is there are three space weather drivers that we, we talk about, is the flares coming off the sun. Again, those huge explosions um, that if you kind of bottled up that energy, um, would run the US power grid for 80,000 years. Um, the coronal mass ejections, these billions of tons of material, all those school buses that are racing towards us. Um, and then energetic particles, which are the fastest, uh, fastest things that would be the first messengers that come and interact with our earth and its atmosphere and help create that aurora. So other things that that space weather can affect on the Earth before, besides just the, the gorgeous aurora, um, in some ways you would think that would be a bonus uh, that the sun gives us and helps tourism in the north. Um, however, it can also do things like damage satellite spacecraft electronics. Um, it would it could harm uh, astronauts if they're out on spacewalks. Um, it also it, it disturbs the ionosphere, which is used for a lot of communications and GPS signal. Um, so in terms of that, we really do rely now on our GPS and, and on those types of communication. Um, so that's important for us to understand when these things, uh, when the storms are going on in the sun and how they're going to affect the earth and our technology here. Um, it can also induce ground currents that can wreak havoc on um, power grids. And doing that, it could block out uh, blackout cities, which again would be uh, catastrophic. So we're we're trying to really understand how this uh, how this all works. So the other reason why we do Parker Solar Probe is a scientific curiosity. Um, so the sun is mysterious, and it does at least two very weird things um, that we're trying to still figure out. So the first of which is in the center is the heat source of the sun um, that actually is creating a fusion, pushing atoms together to make energy and releasing energy in the process. So that's its, its, its campfire in the center of the sun. And as you go away from that center, um, it gets colder. That yellow disk that I showed you is around 5,000 degrees from the 15 million in the center. Um, and then as you go out to its atmosphere, to that which hangs around that yellow disk, um, it goes back up to a million degrees. So there's some heating process that as you've walked away from your campfire, you've actually gotten hotter, which is not something that we experience here on Earth. Um, so that's one of the scientific curiosities we went to go investigate. And this is again, the, the sun uh, is hotter here, cooler here, and then the atmosphere again gets up to millions of degrees. So we have a couple of theories um, that of how this works and uh, the images on the left, the movies that are playing um, are taken by that atmospheric imaging assembly and we're watching the sun's uh, plasma or gas, very hot gas, dance and churn and move, um, especially this row uh, kind of right along the center. Um, so this, uh, this is a cartoon of what we think happens that it heats as the magnetic fields are being sh uh, shook along uh, along the surface. And then this movie uh, on the right shows that uh, those explosions, a flare happening here, so those a uh, large amount of energy releases in this uh, explosion could happen by rubbing of magnetic fields and in that explosion then sending off uh, plasma. So we went to closer to investigate to see which one could possibly be heating the corona. Now, how we go in closer is that was Parker launching from the Earth and now going in again and again to the sun and then back out. Um, it'll interact with Venus um, from time to time and actually push itself closer and closer. Um, and so that's why we need to make sure that the planets were actually aligned um, so that we could uh, use Venus seven times to push ourselves closer and closer into the center uh, towards the center of the sun um, at uh, 9.86 uh, solar radii from the sun. So that's 96% of the way there. And once we're there, 
we had to make a model of, of uh, what we wanted to do. And sometimes you use what you have left over at lunch. Um, but we knew we needed to measure the temperature because we were worried about what was warm. Um, something like an anemometer. So figuring out which is the wind direction and all that stuff blowing off at. Um, we wanted to talk about the magnetic field since I've mentioned magnetic fields multiple times. And then we always want to take a picture um, of where we go whenever we do explore. So those were the basis of why uh, of things that we wanted to take with us or instruments that we needed to build in order to successfully meet our scientific um, objectives. And the part that I was most uh, involved with was the solar wind electron alphas and protons um, instrument suite, which is the sweep suite. Um, and this uh, solar probe cup uh, peaks around the heat shield. This heat shield right here protects most of the spacecraft um, from the sun and keeps it at just about a little under room temperature um, for, for most of the time, a little bit cooler sometimes, um, even to the point where we need heaters when we're actually at closest approach on the back end because there's no other heat except for the sun. And when you block it all out up here, there's nothing um, going on the back, but the, the cup pokes around the side to actually sample um, the, the gas directly. Um, and then we have two other uh, analyzers on either side. This is actually a liquid cooled um, system. So these are uh, liquid water uh, radiators um, behind the heat shield. Uh, these are our solar arrays um, and then a magnetic uh, thing. And this is our phone for home, our uh, phone home um, device or our, our satellite dish uh, to uh, talk to high gate antenna uh, to talk to the earth and send back data. So what SWEEP measures is the speed, the density, and the temperature um, of the solar wind. Uh, so how much of it there is, is all of the uh, all of the area under the curve, we're adding up how many particles we have. The temperature is about how wide they are and the velocity is where they peak. The number of them are peaked. So we can get hydrogen and helium um, and we can also do electrons. So this is the, an image of the actual cup just before it was integrated into the spacecraft. Um, and we couldn't use things like aluminum. Uh, so we instead had to use things like tungsten, molybdenum, uh, niobium, titanium, and sapphire because um, these, these will survive the temperatures that this cup uh, has undergone and will undergone. So the sapphire is actually in here. It's not the typical blue that you would see in a gemstone, uh, but a white of a, of a lab-made uh, uh, sapphire. Um, and we can't use epoxy. We do sometimes glue things down so, so screws don't shake loose upon um, rocket launch because rocket launches shake things a lot and we don't want things to fall out. So instead there's these braided wires twisted together um, and these very, very small screws uh, that are really hard to see, let alone also uh, tie down. And so everything is safety wired. We couldn't also use normal um, testing facilities uh, because they just didn't go up to those temperatures. So this is IMAX foam projectors that instead of being projected out are actually refocused in and a couple of them together can recreate the sun, um, focus back in here, can recreate the sun on the cup that's hiding in the, in the vacuum chamber. We did a lot of tests to make sure that we were going to be able to survive um, and uh, proceed with mission. This is a testing the solar panel. So this purple light is testing each row to make sure that it's gonna get the right amount. It's going to be able to react and generate the power that we need as we're on our seven year mission. And this was uh, the picture on top of the rocket. So this is uh, the Delta, part of the Delta IV Heavy uh, down here. And this is the fairing, the yellow uh, grid is the fairing that closes around it. Um, and the Faraday cup is up top here with the heat shield up here and the other parts of sweeper down here um, as well. So again, uh, this is a large team that pulls this all together. There were the scientists and engineers that um, put together the cup and uh, was placed on this, uh, just before it was placed on, placed on the spacecraft. There are the launch, some of the launch vehicle folks, all these scientists and more. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Dr. Gene Parker, uh, who is the, um, who the satellite was named after had passed away in the last uh, week or so. And uh, he was a very great man, very persistent, uh, very kind, um, and really just had a huge effect on all of us. Uh, but, but there are, and there are so many uh, more folks who are studying this and who are benefiting from all of his brilliance. So some of the things that we found, um, one of the things that 
uh, the, the, our camera whisper was able to take a picture of was Comet uh, Nusoy, which um, was unexpected that we came across that. Then there was Venus. So uh, originally we were not slated to turn on uh, around Venus, but we found that we were able to. So uh, the camera came on and snapped this picture. And what's special about this picture is actually seeing for the first time from space, um, the cloud cover. Um, and then this matching of the uh, radar that was shown uh, in previous missions to, uh, to Venus with the um, white light or visible light uh, that Whisper is able to see. Um, and they match very, very well um, in terms of what's going on on the surface. So this was a really great discovery that we just did not uh, think we were going to have, but Parker was able to deliver. The next thing I um, was going to talk about is meteorites. Um, so meteorites, you sometimes see streaking, uh, streaking through the sky. And um, you know, there, there are still questions there. And so although Parker does not have a dedicated uh, dust detector, it was able to really look at the dust cloud, the zodiacal dust cloud that has fragments. And that due to the sun's pressure, um, these beta meteorites sometimes escape the solar system due to the fact that they're being flung out. And so Parker is, is traveling through some of these and is uh, taking measurements and able to measure between um, the, uh, the camera actually seeing them as well as the electric field antennas registering an electrical signal from them. Um, so as they collide, there's these other ones that go away from their orbit. And so they were actually able to create this picture of what's happening um, from Parker Solar Probe data. So again, we didn't originally go in there and this was another surprise um, about where these exactly, where this, uh, where they're coming from, as well as where uh, they're going in terms of these meteorites that are being formed um, throughout the solar system. So another very interesting result um, is the coronal mass ejection. So this is a complementary uh, satellite, part of the Heliophysics um, System Observatory, the stereo satellite, took a picture of the sun in November of 2018 and a, and a few images um, together. And it looks relatively benign. There is some activity, there looks like there's some things going off, but nothing very drastic. When you do a running difference, if you're looking to this side, you start to see that there was actually a coronal mass ejection. So a running difference means you're subtracting one image from the next so that you're getting the difference between the two. So you, you can more easily see what the coronal mass ejection is doing or what the, what the sun's corona and solar wind are doing. So this is a baby picture that only a scientist can love. Um, this is what uh, the sweep in the, the particle and fields data looks like for that coronal mass ejection. And the coronal mass ejection specifically is between the two dotted lines. So you have time on the bottom and as time goes on, um, you get different blips based on um, the temperature, the density, the velocity and the magnetic fields. Um, and this change in magnetic field is one of the indications um, that you have this, uh, as well as the changes in velocity and the temperature. Um, so this was the first uh, coronal mass ejection that Parker saw very close to the sun, the closest ever um, observed to the sun. And it was, it was very, uh, it was slower um, and a little different than what we normally observe out at Earth. So this was uh, a new discovery as to watching this, the coronal mass ejections as their first um, released from the sun. So looking at what's next, um, coming up in June, so a few months from now, we'll go into perihelion 12. So each time we come close to the sun, it's a perihelion. We have 26 total. Um, we're at number 12 in June. And then in September, uh, same distance, we'll do it again, December, um, and on and on until August of 23, where we'll do another um, Venus flyby. And every time we do a Venus flyby, Parker breaks her own record, speed and distance record um, as the fastest human-made object, as well as the closest to the sun. So there'll be another step in closer to the sun. There'll be a few orbits. Then November 2024, it'll be the final Venus flyby. 
and um, again, breaking her own speed and distance record, uh, going as close to the sun as the mission can do. And then on perihelion 26 in December of 2025 will be uh, the last of the nominal part of the mission for Parker um, and touching the atmosphere again um, and getting a feel for what's happening there.